Welcome and bienvenue. A warm welcome to everyone joining us this evening for a very special Visionary Voices coming to you live on location at the Aga Khan Garden here at the University of Alberta Botanic Garden just outside of Edmonton. My name is Salima Ibrahim and it's an honor to be your MC this evening. Today we have a unique opportunity for an insider's look at the garden and a chance to explore this beautiful space. The garden we are in today was a gift to the University of Alberta from His Highness the Aga Khan. Celebrating over 40 years of partnership between the Aga Khan Development Network, AKDN, and the University of Alberta. At the convocation ceremony of the University of Alberta in 2009, His Highness first announced his desire to give a gift that would celebrate the university's 100th anniversary and his own golden jubilee, marking 50 years since he became Imam or spiritual leader of the Shia Ismaili Muslim community. The garden has realized his wish to create a space of educational and aesthetic value, a setting for enhancing our understanding of Islamic culture and design, and a place for public reflection and enjoyment. And so we are here today to reflect on the importance of spaces like this and how they foster intercultural understanding, pluralism, and connection. This evening's program will begin with a look back at the official inauguration of the Aga Khan Garden in 2018 followed by a conversation with two visionaries leading their respective institutions through what has been an unprecedented time of crisis and change. His Worship John Iveson, Mayor of Edmonton, and Bill Flanagan, who recently assumed his role as President of the University of Alberta. This will be followed by a fascinating discussion between two renowned architects, Thomas Waltz, one of the leading landscape architects in the world, and Hanif Kara, a decorated and accomplished structural engineer and professor at the Harvard School of Design. To start our program, we revisit a very special day just two years ago on October 16th, 2018, when His Highness the Aga Khan officially inaugurated the Aga Khan Garden, Alberta, the northernmost Islamic garden in the world, and the first garden of its kind in Western Canada, and shared with us his vision for this incredible space. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Honor, Lois Mitchell, the Honorable Rachel Notley, Honorable Ministers, Your Worships, Chancellor Stollery, President Turpin, distinguished guests. It is always a great pleasure to greet old friends and welcome new friends at a celebration like this. But today's inauguration stands out for me as particularly joyous. For one thing, the old friendships we renew today are especially meaningful. We look back, of course, to the welcome in Alberta of members of the Ismaili community who settled here almost half a century ago, often in very difficult circumstances. And those bonds of welcome have been continually renewed through the years, especially through our rewarding partnerships with the University of Alberta. One of the special gifts that old friends offer is introducing us to wonderful new friends. And that has also happened here. The project we celebrate today, the inauguration of the Archon Garden, is a particularly happy example. I think all of you have had the pleasure in your personal life or your professional life of seeing a fascinating story develop happily from beginning to end. We recall the excitement of a new beginning, as well as that deep sense of grateful satisfaction when the planning works, when the hope is realized and the vision is achieved. Well, that is exactly how I feel today. I was fortunate to have been part of this project's conception, and I feel fortunate to be here today to help mark its realization. I remember well my visits to the University of Alberta during my Golden Jubilee year in 2008, and again for the graduation ceremonies in 2009. That was when we first discussed this dream of creating here, together, a new Islamic garden. I paid my first visit to the proposed garden site at that time, 
wondering even then just how this dream might come true in practice. It seemed like an unlikely dream to many. After all, the great traditions of Islamic gardens has its roots in very different times and places. The symbol of the garden as a spiritual symbol goes back to the Holy Quran itself, where the garden ideal is mentioned many times. Down through many centuries, Islamic culture has continued to see the garden as a very special place where the human meets further proof of the divine. The development of the garden as a symbol of Islamic ideals flourished most magnificently some 500 to 600 years ago. And that happened, of course, in the warmer climates of southern Asia. And yet, there we were in Edmonton a decade ago, proposing to extend that lovely eastern and southern tradition at the start of the 21st century to the unique natural environment, somewhat cold, <laughs> of northern and western Canada. This proposed new garden, to be precise, would be the northernmost Islamic garden ever created. Over the past nine years, I have been able to watch the dream come true as we agreed on the configuration of the site, assembled a steering committee, chose an architectural firm, and reviewed development plans. And then, with the planning completed, the building process took just some 18 months, finishing on time and on budget, as planners like to point out. <laughs> Me too. As I look out at this garden today, what I think about, above all, are the people who made it possible, their dedication, their talent, and their remarkable energy. I want them all to know that in celebrating this new garden today, we're also celebrating them. Theirs is a highly valued gift to the generations to come, who also must be privileged by experiencing the spirituality and harmony of multiple life forms. They include construction workers and gardeners, planners and administrators, artists and scholars, architects and designers, including the landscape design firm of Nelson Bird Waltz. They include dedicated members of the Ismaili and other Muslim communities in Alberta and other parts of Canada, the remarkable family of the University of Alberta, government officials at all levels, and those who serve the Arkan Trust for Culture and the Arkan Development Network. At the heart of their efforts, of course, was the inspiring power of the Islamic Garden itself. For a central part of the garden tradition is the high calling of human stewardship, our responsibility to honor, to protect, and to share the gifts of the natural world. Gardens in this context can be seen not as imitations of nature, but as humanity's interpretations of nature, their geometric structures providing a human framework in which we can experience, in this case, the magnificent fluctuations of the Albertan landscape. The Garden of Islamic Tradition is also a place where the flow of refreshing water reminds us of divine blessing. It is a place for meditation and quiet renewal. But I would likewise emphasize that the garden through history has also been seen as a social space, a place for learning, for sharing, for romance, for diplomacy, for reflection on the destiny of the human race. And even as we share the garden experience with others, we can feel a connection with those who walked through similar gardens in the past. 
I would also mention one additional aspect of the particular garden we inaugurate today. It symbolizes not only the creative blending of the natural and the human, but also the beauty of multiple intercultural cooperation. One of the great questions facing humanity today is how we can honor what is distinctive about our separate identities and, at the same time, welcome a diversity of identities as positive elements in our lives. This city and this country have been among the world leaders in providing positive answers to that ancient question. The project we inaugurate today is a beautiful extension of that Canadian tradition. In Canada and in many other places, the Archon Trust for Culture has made a major commitment to creating and renewing important green spaces in recent years. We can look back on 10 recent successes in places ranging from Cairo to Zanzibar, from Toronto to Kabul, from Dushanbe in Tajikistan to Bamako in Mali. In 2018 alone, I helped to inaugurate three such garden projects in London, in Delhi, and now here in Alberta. But the story does not end here. In fact, the story of Canadian Islamic gardens itself is not yet completed. Our plans are now advancing, in fact, for a new park to be developed a few hundred miles southwest of here in Burnaby, British Columbia. Yes, to be sure, it will surpass Edmonton <laughs> as the westernmost Islamic garden. <laughs> But, of course, we can be assured that Edmonton's garden will still have a lasting claim as the northernmost. <laughs> I've talked about the past today, but I would close by emphasizing the future. It is wonderful, at a moment like this, to think of all those who will visit here in the years to come. Our work now is to sustain this space, to create new experiences, and to meet new challenges. As you walk through these gardens, you will see evidence of the ways in which future generations will be able to make the most of this site. It is our hope and expectation on this special day that the Arkan Garden here at the University of Alberta will truly be a gift that keeps on giving. Thank you. Mayor Iveson, I want to start a question for you. As you had the privilege of being here two years ago when His Highness inaugurated the garden, can you tell us what that day was like and what you took away from that day? Well, it was a busy day in our city. It was a beautiful fall day. And uh, that morning we had uh, the UN Women's Safe Cities Conference in town. So people from all over the world talking about building safer communities for women and girls in particular. And then the chance to run out here in the afternoon uh, to welcome His Highness and thank him for his generosity for our community. But what I remember most uh, strongly from that day, besides all of the leaders from diverse communities in our university who were there, was actually the music. Uh, the performances uh, that, that afternoon were just absolutely transcendent. And, um, and wove together sort of a sense of something otherworldly that was happening, something spiritual that was happening, the significance of the gift that was being bestowed on our community and our university. Uh, and art really brought that to life as much as the very thoughtful comments offered by all the speakers, including this. 
Thank you. It's it's yeah. It's nice when you mention culture and arts and music. I think they have a way of weaving together communities and the world, really. Which brings me to my next question, President Flanagan. So the University of Alberta has had a very long relationship with the Aga Khan Development Network, um, a relationship that actually led to the dedication of this gardens. As you start your presidency, can you talk to us a little bit more about the role of the University of Alberta playing internationally? Um, with institutions like AKDN, but also other ones. Yes, well, first, I just want to say how thrilled we are to partner with the Aga Khan on this marvelous garden around. And I've had an opportunity to tour the garden uh, earlier this summer, and it was, it's a beautiful moment, and it's such a beautiful gift to the community. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of the University of Alberta, and uh, not only for this garden, but for really a flourishing relationship with the Ishmali community here in Edmonton and beyond. And as you mentioned, we have viewers from around the world. And so we are really thrilled to share this gorgeous garden and this beautiful experience with viewers from around the world. And speaking of around the world, as you know, the University of Alberta is a uniquely internationally focused university. Almost 20% of our students are international students at the University of Alberta. Something we're very proud of, that we welcome students from around the globe, from Asia, from Southeast Asia, Africa, and indeed, we see those numbers growing in the future. And of course, this is not only wonderful for the University of Alberta, because it brings enormously talented students to the university, but many of these students might choose to stay in Alberta or Canada and build a life in Canada. And as you know, that is the Canadian story, drawing people from around the globe, building a very diverse multicultural society that I think is admired around the globe for what we're able to achieve. And so the garden, I think, is a beautiful symbol of that partnership, that, that, that global partnership, and uh, a, welcoming, uh, a welcoming experience for all who come. That's great. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I read a statistic that almost 100,000 students come to Edmonton each year from all of our post-secondary institutions. And I think they really add to the vibrancy of who we are as a city and as a community. Um, but maybe taking a bit of a different angle. So I think one of the great questions that are facing us today, and we've really been, I mean, 2020 has been interesting from a number of different perspectives, but we've had a lot of conversations, um, some challenging around the idea of racism and discrimination. And I think there's something about settings like this, uh, whether they're public institutions or gardens that are accessible by all, that allow for a certain level of dialogue around really important um, questions like identity and discrimination. Could you talk to us a little bit, and this question's for both of you, but why places such as this one um, that bring together people from different backgrounds and facilitate positive social interactions are so important to have in and invest in, particularly right now when I think we're going through a pretty challenging time. So Mayor Iveson, could I ask you to start? Well, it's a deep question, um, and, and my short answer is that this is what cities have been doing for 5,000 years. It's the place where people come together um, at something greater than a sort of tribal or family unit level and have to find ways to work together. And the cities that do that the best, that have the culture that allows uh, for peace and for rule of law and for prosperity and for collaboration. Those are the cities that are winning in the world. It's been that way for thousands of years, but the imperative as uh, borders get uh, shorter in a way and communities get more and more diverse, the imperative for pluralism, for inclusion, for respect, for new kinds of collaboration made more possible by technology than ever, um, that, that has unleashed a very, very rapid uh, pace of change and development and competitive imperative for cities to be welcoming for everyone. And this is where I think Canadian cities have an edge in this world. And it's where our city, uh, recognizing its heritage as a relatively new place from a settlement and colonization point of view, but a very, very ancient place from an indigenous point of view, is rooted at, at uh, you know, on this bend in the river, at the crossroads of deep human history of collaboration on these lands. Um, a welcome of, um, of settlers and explorers and traders who came here, the flourishing of the Métis culture, which represents a blending of those two, and then a city that is one of the most diverse in our country, uh, perhaps not the most diverse, but certainly um, flourishes and benefits from connectivity to all parts of the world through the, the different um, 
uh, communities that you find in our city. And so that is very much the strength of our city. The university is like a city within a city that is a locus of that and refreshed and renewed, as President Flanagan said, by international students, uh, by connectivity to international thought communities, and by professors from all around the world who bring their families and their connectivity and add their diversity and their culture to our community. So being a university town connected to the world um, is sort of table stakes for competitiveness in this day and age. But to know that uh, in the Ismaili community and, and thanks to the work with the Aga Khan Development Network that His Highness sees this as the kind of place uh, worthy of, of a gift of this garden where we can make manifest that pluralism, where we can bring people together um, from all walks of life for weddings, for events, or just quiet contemplation um, and host and nurture uh, that kind of colla intercultural collaboration, appreciation of other faiths uh, and cultures and the arts. Um, great, cities, uh, great cities do that, but it doesn't happen on its own. It's people and their generosity that makes that possible, and it's a culture that's very Canadian um, that resonates through the landscape and, and the garden here. President Flanagan, from your perspective, as president of you know, the University of Alberta, which is an amazing university, my alma mater. Um, any further comments to what Mayor Iveson just said in relation to <clears throat> just challenging conversations and maybe to you specifically, but the role that post-secondary institutions um, in Edmonton and in Canada can play to help furthering that dialogue? Yes, well, first I'll say Mayor Iveson is a tough act to follow. <laughs> Very thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> Very thoughtful comments. But yeah, as I, as I reflect on the garden here, I see <clears throat> what brings people together. And uh, the garden certainly does that. And it reminds us that we share more than what divides us. And I think as, as, as people, we share a love of the beauty of the garden, the sense of place, and indeed uh, Mayor Iveson's comments about the indigenous traditions of the land and the sense of place that goes back centuries here in this, on these lands, I think is also reflected in this garden. And so it's an opportunity, I think, to reflect on, on beauty, on tranquility, on peace, and on what pulls us together as, as, as a people. And so in that regard, uh, the University of Alberta, of course, is deeply committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion in all that we do. We have an enormously diverse population at the university. Students, as I mentioned, from around the world, faculty and staff that represent the wonderful diversity that is Canada. There's always more that we can do, of course, to ensure that the university is truly the inclusive community that we want it to be. And uh, we're, But I think I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve at the University of Alberta, particularly our commitment to the Indigenous peoples of these lands, Indigenous ways of knowing, of teaching, and of research, and of knowledge. It's something that we've reflected on very deeply at the University of Alberta. Again, much more that we need to do, but as you mentioned, I grew up in Alberta, and I know that this is a tradition and a, and a knowledge that was not always well understood or well respected in Alberta. And so I'm deeply moved to return to Alberta and see how, how, how important and a part of the university that is. And likewise, again, all of the students that we draw from around the world and all of the richness that that brings to the university is something that we celebrate and embrace. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, uh, it adds huge value to the, to the city. And um, I know personally, I left for 10 years and came back. And a lot of the reason was Edmonton's just a really special place, I think. Yes. And it's, it's a community of communities um, in many senses. And I think draws people from across the world and yet small enough that you can actually have very deep relationships with each other, which is, which is quite special. Um, you know, as we sit here and it's fall and you kind of see all of these beautiful colors, um, the idea of environmental sustainability is also important. And I know in, in both the City of Edmonton strategic plan as well as in the universities, it's, it's a strategic pillar. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about, um, Mayor Arson, maybe I'll start with you, why it's important for cities to be leading in the area of environmental sustainability. Um, and then uh, President Flanagan, I'll ask you to follow up in terms of why is it important for universities to support the communities that they're in? I think there are a few reasons why cities uh, have never been more important to this. One, um, we are where now more than half of humanity resides on a very small fraction of the Earth's surface, and yet our impact 
on the biosphere, on the oceans, on forests, on croplands, and the air shed stretches way beyond the physical boundaries of the city. The supply chains that run into cities and the waste streams that run out of cities are now changing the planet itself. Some people call this the Anthropocene, which is to say the age in which uh, human beings are now having geological effect on our planet. And the city uh, of Edmonton is a founding member of a number of different international organizations working on climate, working on biodiversity uh, at the network scale of, of dozens or hundreds or thousands of cities with shared goals to make sure that um, we leverage what I was talking about previously, uh, which is our capacity for innovation with a sense of stewardship around our impact on the land and water and, and also with a sense of intergenerational stewardship because uh, some of the implications of what we've done historically we're dealing with now, the consequences of what we're doing now will be uh, felt by our children. And so an intergenerational perspective on these, I think it seems harder and harder to achieve internationally and by nation states uh, seems fleeting at the subnational level, except in cities. Cities and local governments, urban and rural, but particularly many of the large cities uh, in the world, have formed networks um, in partnership with their universities, researchers, subject matter experts, knowledge-based networks to try to solve some of the world's most complex challenges, create new economic opportunity while we do it, and reduce the harmful impacts on the natural systems that sustain life and make our economy possible in the first place. So cities are raising the level of debate uh, in the world on these questions. Um, and, and I think that the imperatives are becoming more and more clear and the voice of young people calling for that change are becoming more and more urgent. And that is, that is heard, I think, most clearly at, at city halls in this country and, and around the world. And um, the city of Edmonton takes those responsibilities, those obligations very seriously. And, and it did when I was a teenager, it's not my leadership. It's actually inculcated in our organization and in the culture of the city. And you, you see this in our river valley and our approach to natural areas uh, and our concern for nature, our concern for reducing our environmental impact. Uh, and so in so many different ways, including partnerships with industry around innovation in energy, in innovation in, in water, uh, all, the, all the new science that we need, much of which has been built historically at our university and, and other post-secondary institutions and in industry labs. You know, we're, we're now hacking the planet um, and, and we've been taking it in the wrong direction. We now need all the solutions from all the bright minds from different parts of the world and again it's it's at the crossroads of that innovation are in cities and especially at our universities and so there's never been a greater imperative for leadership from the bottom up from thoughtful people from diverse perspectives interested in facts and science who can make a difference i believe cities have a tremendous leadership role in this acting individually but especially acting collectively uh, in networks that can get this done where where subnational and national actors are are failing us quite frankly president flanagan i think mayor Iveson made a great point we do draw a lot from our universities so could you talk to me a little bit about why is it important for universities to invest in the communities that they're in yes well community engagement has really been at the core of the university of alberta since its inception as you know the university was established in 1908 shortly after the province was established and it was really established to help build the province and, and uplift the people and provide opportunity for all the people of these lands. And so the University of Alberta has been deeply embedded in the history and life of the province since its inception. And community engagement is so important to what we do at the University of Alberta, not only in our local communities here in Edmonton, but also beyond and in Alberta, and indeed now a reach that spans the globe. Uh, one of the top-ranked universities in the world, the University of Alberta. And just building on some of Mayor Ivinson's comments, we're also a world leader in sustainable energy systems research and really thinking deeply and creatively about what energy systems of the future will look like. Just one of the many contributions that the University of Alberta is making in research and advancing the communities that we serve, not only locally, but as I said, really here around the world. And having grown up in Alberta, I know the importance of the University of Alberta to Alberta and to the communities that it serves. It's something that's in my DNA. My parents were both very proud graduates of the University of Alberta 
uh, both school teachers in my family and in my childhood growing up, education was everything. Uh, the world began and ended with a good book. And I learned that from my parents and it's a legacy that I carry with me. And it's a legacy that they developed at the University of Alberta. And so the important role of the university in transforming people's lives and opening up doors and opening up opportunity and really transforming our communities is something that we can never lose sight of. And I, again, in returning to Alberta and the U of A, I'm reminded of just how proud the community is of the University of Alberta and how deeply they care about the well-being of the university. And that is a resource that is priceless. It can, cannot be, can, there you, can, you cannot put a price on the value of that to the university. And likewise, uh, we cherish those community connections and look forward to continuing to build on them. Good. Well, we're very happy to have you back in Edmonton, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so for our final question, a bit more reflective, and we're in a space of reflection here as well. Um, President Flanagan, you're just starting on your journey right now um, as president of one of the great universities of the world. And Mayor Iveson, you're actually coming to the last year in a four-year election cycle. Wondering, uh, knowing that you've got an international audience um, here, just a, a, a question of introspection. If we brought you back in a year, what would success look like to you? What are you both hoping to achieve over the coming year? And maybe President Flanagan, I'll start with you. Well, I have to say it's hard to top the recent success of the University of Alberta with the Nobel Prize in Medicine yes, for Dr. Michael Houghton. And I just wanted to mention that uh, again, just how enormously we pr proud we are of Professor Houghton and his contributions in identifying the hepatitis C virus, which has gone on to ensure that the world's blood supply is safe. And from that development, has, uh, treatments have been discovered that can now cure hepatitis C. And we're en route to developing a vaccine. And, our, and of course, the Virology Institute at the University of Alberta is also actively investigating COVID and vaccine and treatment for COVID. So where do we want to be in two years? Did you say two years? A year? A year? Yeah. Uh, well, I'd love, another, I'd love another Nobel Prize, <laughs> but, 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 but perhaps we, we can't aim just that high just yet. But as you mentioned, it's a time of transformation at the university. Uh, we're calling it the University of Alberta for tomorrow. And with COVID and the financial challenges facing the province, I think we all recognize that this is a deeply challenging time for Alberta. And as I mentioned earlier, the University of Alberta has always been there for the people of Alberta, always been there as an engine of economic growth and opportunity and creativity. And I think it's never been more needed than it is today, given the scale of the challenges facing the province. So we're undertaking a process of restructuring, academic and administrative restructuring, really trying to find the efficiencies so that we can reduce our administrative costs and invest the maximum amount we can in our core mission of teaching, research and community engagement. And even further strengthen our ability to be that engine of economic growth and opportunity and creativity in Alberta that I, as I mentioned, I think has never been more needed than now. And we, were, we have always been a partner in building opportunity for the people of Alberta. It's a partnership we cherish and it's one that we will continue to build on. So I would like us to be in a year from now, having achieved some of our goals in this uh, University of Alberta for tomorrow, having thought very creatively about what that university will look like, what it can do and how it can better serve the communities it's, in which it's embedded and indeed then leading the way for opportunities for growth and a continued enormous contribution to the future of the province. Sounds exciting <laughs> and ambitious. It, it is both. <laughs> Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you. I'm glad you didn't come to me first because I really <laughs> needed a minute to think about <laughs> this because it's, it's getting harder to think a year out uh, and yet we need that long-term and intergenerational thinking now more than ever to seize the opportunities that come with the challenges that we're facing. Um, and in a way, you know, it is a bit like gardening. We've got a lot of bugs this year in the garden called COVID-19. Um, but next year, something will grow back different that, and we might plant something different. And so that stewardship, that, that resiliency, that reacting, um, and not just reacting thoughtlessly, but responding to the need to do things differently in a scarcer environment, certainly economically, 
Um, you know, I, I think I'll catalog a few hopes for, for the next year. I hope that uh, an Edmontonian uh, holds the patent. Uh, an Edmontonian, perhaps a researcher at the University of Alberta, holds the patent uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll for, for the first vaccine. Uh, and that, um, uh, you know, some of our private sector partners who produce some of the world's uh, um, most important antiviral drugs right here in our city and region are, are mass producing it for the world. And that that gives us an edge in, in reopening the economy confidently and getting back to um, something that looks normal again in terms of our ability to be amongst each other as social creatures. Because I think that the bonds of our, of our civilization are struggling as social creatures and then because of these economic challenges, I think it's been very, very hard on people uh, to go through the last six or eight months. And I hope that there's a ray of hope in the next month or in the next year that that gets us out of that. But we've also just seen tremendous creativity and resiliency in the private sector, in the not-for-profit sector, um, tremendous generosity from faith communities uh, and philanthropists. Um, and I think in that way, we'll all look back on this as one of those times where we really came together in a way that as humans, we haven't been tested for generations. And so I hope that we'll be stronger for this a year from now. I hope that we'll have uh, taken the opportunity to do great works like ending homelessness in our community which were just relentlessly focused on making sure no one is out in the cold it was unacceptable before this that we had homeless people in a community as wealthy and as uh, as committed to inclusion as as ours um, and so we have some of those milestones in sight and you would think it's harder to do those because of the economic pressure but in another way more things are possible than than were possible before. Uh, new, new moves are on the table, new things can be planted, new things can grow. And so I hope that this will actually redefine the art of the possible. And that uh, we've seen that governments can work together in ways that they before maybe thought they couldn't, that civil society can leverage and activate in ways that we've maybe forgotten how or atrophied over time. And that uh, diverse communities can, like ours can come together with singular purpose to tackle something like COVID, tack tackle these economic challenges, and do so in a way that is just and compassionate and inclusive and brings everyone along, not just some people. And so I really hope that our community will be able to continue to provide that kind of leadership and inspire others to follow. Thank you. I think that's a lovely note to actually end on. It's a, it's a note of hope um, during this year. And I agree with you. I think despite the challenges of 2020, there's been a sense of coming together um, that I don't think I felt before. So thank you so much again for joining us tonight uh, in this beautiful Islamic garden. And who knows, maybe we'll see you guys both here next year. Thank, thank you. you. We now have the privilege of hearing from the man who took the vision of this garden and brought it to life, Thomas Waltz. Thomas is the owner of Nelson Bird Waltz Landscape Architects. He was named the Design Innovator of the Year by the Wall Street Journal magazine in 2013. In 2011, he was invested into the American Society of Landscape Architects Council of Fellows, one of the highest honors in his profession. During the past 20 years of practice, Thomas has crafted a body of work that integrates beauty, function, and form. His exquisite craftsmanship and sensitivity to complex biological systems has yielded thousands of acres of reforested land, reconstructed wetlands, native meadows, and flourishing wildlife habitat. His design work infuses places where people live, work, and play with narratives of the land that inspire stewardship. Many of these projects focus on restoration of damaged ecological infrastructure within working farmland and create models of biodiversity and sustainable agriculture. One of the most sought after landscape architects on the continent, his current projects include Hudson Yards in New York, City, Memorial Park in Houston, the Ismaili Center Houston, and Cornwall Park in Auckland, New Zealand. Joining Thomas is Professor Hanif Kara. Professor Kara is a practicing structural engineer and professor in practice of architectural technology at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. He is recognized for linking design, research, education, and practice. As design director and co-founder of AKT2, his particular design-led approach and interest in innovative form, pushing material uses, sustainable construction, and complex analysis methods have allowed him to work on numerous pioneering projects at the forefront of many challenges facing the built environment. 
Hanif's career extends into wider areas of design beyond the structural engineering disciplines. He is the first engineer to be appointed on the steering committee for the highly regarded International Aga Khan Award for Architecture, where he continues today and was on the awards master jury for the 2004 cycle. He is a fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, Institute of Civil Engineers, Royal Academy of Engineering, Institute of Structural Engineering, the Royal Society of Arts, and sits on the board of trustees of the Architecture Foundation. It's a real pleasure to have these remarkable individuals joining us today. Hanif, over to you. So thank you to the team in Canada for inviting me and the AKTC for asking me to represent you. I am here with Thomas Waltz uh, talking about the gardens in Alberta. Thomas, first question, very very personal, can you recall when you were first ever thought of being a, a, a landscape architect and why? You know, I can recall. Um, I had completed my studies as an undergraduate in architecture at the University of Virginia, but it also added the, the fine arts and architectural history. So after those three degrees, I went to work in Europe and I lived in Venice. And Venice as a city, uh, without a lot of the landscapes that I thought were landscapes, such as meadows, forests, fields, gardens, but rather a mineral city of, of water in the streets and stone paving and plazas, I realized I was having an incredible landscape experience every day, but it wasn't the language of landscape that I had always assumed growing up on a farm in the United States. And it was somehow in that five years that I started to understand that everything outside the building is something that can be designed and they are landscapes. And so that led me to an interest in landscape architecture. And when I came back to the United States to complete my graduate studies, I first did a, a degree in architecture and then a second degree in landscape architecture, went to work for one of my professors and have been doing that for the last 22 years. So that was my journey to it, but it was understanding the landscape as something more abstract than gardens. So the journey from a farm to understanding landscapes appears quite a distance from the Aga Khan garden. Um, was that your first work on Islamic gardens? And can you share with us how you were selected for that project uh, and I... what your first contact with His Highness and his team was like? The, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture reached out to our office, I believe in 2009, and we were invited to submit credentials for their review. And after a few months, we heard back from them that we were invited to uh, interview uh, directly with His Highness. Um, this was absolutely our first uh, Islamic, Islamicate landscape but it was definitely not my first uh, introduction to the, the power and history of Islamic gardens. Uh, I'd studied under Ruben Rainey, who's a fantastic scholar in the history of landscape architecture and had um, always been drawn to and fascinated by the use of geometry, water, fragrance, sound. The key principles of the Islamic landscape had actually had a very formative impact on much of our work, but it was like so many people who have not done the deep research, it remained um, uh, in the realm of perhaps mimicry, in the sense of copying something, or, oh, a rill would be nice here, or a fountain, or, you know, the fragrant plants. So it um, did not have the depth of the journey that we were about to embark on when we were selected for this project, because, you know, in that first meeting with His Highness, you know, I presented the work we had done, and I, I, I think, I hope, he saw within that work the potential to achieve his vision, even though we had never done anything quite like what he was asking us to do. And I'll be forever grateful for that trust that he had in our firm, Nelson Bird Woltz Landscape Architects, to deliver, to deliver a meaningful response to this, uh, this brief or this commission. So, so it would sound like that potential um, obviously gave the right impression. I, I wonder though if 
during that first meeting, you were already aware of where the site was and how was Alberta selected as the site and why in particular this site. That plus, from what it sounds like, nobody asked you the question at that point, so I will. What exactly is an Islamic garden? Okay, that those were two giant questions and I'll, I'll take the first one uh, first and then come back to uh, the Islamic garden question. Uh, we were told that the site would be in Edmonton, Alberta, and that the selected site was part of uh, what was then called the Devonian Botanic Garden and now is called the University of Alberta Botanic Garden, and that it would be part of the collection of gardens that the University of Alberta Botanic Garden manages. So we knew that it was very cold, um, that the climate was unlike uh, many climates familiar to the Islamic uh, diaspora of gardens, and that the that would be a great challenge. I was excited that it was part of a botanic garden because the the horticultural knowledge, the care, the maintenance, the commitment to a garden open to the public realm would all be in place, presumably. So that was very exciting as a firm that designs mostly public parks, public gardens, uh, and botanic gardens. Um, this was quite exciting uh, to us. I'll get to it later, but the other part of work that our firm does is very large-scale sustainable agricultural operations. And that's just a hint of, of what I'll talk about later when we dive into the garden. So yes, we, we did know about the site. I believe um, uh, His Highness's choice of Edmonton came from the community. I think it was a suggestion uh, coming out of the Canadian Ismaili community that um, there had been a, a long history of, of uh, graduates from the University of Alberta coming to work, particularly in the medical fields, I believe, in different clinics and hospitals that His Highness had created around the world. And so there was a long-standing relationship with the University of Alberta. And you have centers in Ottawa, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and so Edmonton was another of the Canadian uh, departments that uh, could have uh, an important gift. So I think that's where it came from uh, as an idea. And the infrastructure of the Botanic Garden and the university made a tremendous uh, uh, amount of sense for the care of the garden long term. Now, for the bigger question of what did our research reveal as an Islamic garden, that is a, a giant topic uh, that many great scholars uh, beyond my, uh, way beyond my skill set have entertained for generations. And I was very fortunate that His Highness put uh, us in contact with uh, D. Fairchild Ruggles, uh, D.D. Ruggles, and Jim Westcott, to name two um, important scholars in the history of the Islamic landscape. So as my team at Nelson Bird Waltz and I were traveling, reading, absorbing information about the history of the Islamic gardens around the world, we could call them, we had access to them to say, are we on the right track? Does this make sense? Or is this something new that hasn't really been uh, discussed, but more it was them being serving as scholarly mentors to us. So they had a very important role in shaping our understanding. I sound like I'm avoiding the answer probably of what is an Islamic garden. No, no, I was going to ask you, is that common to be given access to authorities? Um, you can go on and answer it, but I just wondered if that was common in your work, where you have access to these sorts of people. In our practice, I would call it a research-based design process within Nelson Bird Waltz, and that really applies to all of our projects. So zooming out for a second and just talking about the mission of our firm, our mission and our process are really fused. We engage in deep research into the ecological history of a site, and in fact, that might be 50 million years ago. When was the site formed geologically? How was it formed? And in that understanding, you will find inspiration for a contemporary landscape design. 
Parallel to that ecological research, we are doing cultural research. So in this case, it was traveling to uh, India and Egypt and reading and going to MIT and Harvard and different libraries, um, meeting with these scholars. So when your process is understanding the ecology and the culture of a place to build a public landscape, that becomes a very authentic source of design ideas. So in a way, it removes you as the author firm. Uh, in some ways, you are a vehicle for creating something new, but based on the very authentic clues that you find within the landscape. So this fit very well into our process. Typically, we have to go find those scholars and ask them to uh, advise us or become part of our team. And in this case, it was His Highness's idea to... Uh, to really offer them uh, in service to our process. And it made a tremendous difference. So so it sounds as though at that point um, and through your traveling, you probably have or could articulate what you think the larger mission of the Aga Khan Garden was and how that manifests into what you built, which might also give you the opportunity to try to unfold what the, the garden was or, or what an Islamic garden is in its... Uh, essence, let's say the simple uh, three or four points about what makes an Islamic garden? Well, I think there are characteristics that many Islamic landscapes have in common. Um, and, and those are things people, um, people are probably quite familiar with. Um, a, a sense of form and order through geometry is probably the most recognizable uh, uh, and well-known idea of the Islamic garden or Islamic landscape. And I'll, I'm actually going to make a little bit of a difference. So let's talk about the Islamic garden for now. So geometry, uh, the famous Chahar Bagh, four gardens. Um, uh, geometry, as in discussions with His Highness that I... I really loved these conversations of understanding that within the Islamic world, within the Muslim world, order and geometry found in nature is a, a proof of the existence of God, the order of the universe. The hand of God is in the structure, the geometric form and structure that we find in nature. So within a flower, within um, uh, the just the form of the landscape, um, the geometric representation of that is the divine. And that geometry present in all living things is proof of the order of the universe. And I just personally really resonated with that idea. Maybe it's also as being trained as an architect and a landscape architect and loving that sense of order in the landscape within a frame of the chaos of context. I always found that very beautiful and very reassuring. And also, having grown up um, in the United States with European descent parents, the Western idea of nature is always naturalistic and romantic and curving paths. And, you know, there's a kind of, maybe it comes mostly through Great Britain, but this legacy of the, of the English landscape as the world as a sort of idealized garden, but it's very romantic and, and um, sort of, uh, uh, picturesque. Instead, the Islamicate landscape is one of order as the proof of God in nature. And I just found that so reassuring and fascinating. Um, so, as I, and I understand that, if I understand it correctly, uh, Thomas, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, the, the geometric framework is, is the tool that you've used the most because that comes from the history of Islamic gardens and from the wider brief. I, I, I understand that you were given. It also comes with a certain rigor. So how would you um, describe the different parts of the garden being connected? Because that kind of rigor can actually create a separation between the parts so that the whole is not coherent. Correct. That is, that I, I would say the, the thread that binds the garden is probably the second uh, most well-known aspect of the Islamic landscape, and that is water. And um, the challenge and exciting 
uh, part of this garden is that it is an Islamic landscape, a new idea of an Islamic landscape for the 21st century, located uh, in an extreme northern climate that is very, very cold and on a site with a lot of specificity. So the challenge was how do we bring this knowledge and this idea of the Islamic landscape and make it also feel Canadian? And so that came through water uh, in many different forms, uh, the ecology of the site, and through horticulture. So um, that was a way that we threaded this into Canada and made anyone coming to visit the garden know at once that they are in an Islamic landscape, but they are also in an essentially Canadian landscape. That's very interesting. It's interesting you bring up water as the sacred and the purity of Islamic gardens, but it's also worth just talking about, you know, where that or originates from the Epic of Gilgamesh and the whole history of water. But what w the sacredness is so important. What what I would ask is, how does it sort of cope with what His Highness has described as the northernmost Islamic garden? Because with that description comes the the thought that it will freeze and all those other things that happen to it. So just give you a chance to say, you know, if that was such an important part and Islam was born in the desert, so we know the relevance of water in that sense. Maybe you can explain to us uh, how, the, how you've used the water specifically. Well, this touches on the journey I took to India. Um, His Highness uh, suggested uh, that I travel to see uh, a long list of different um, Mughal landscapes, and then also to Egypt to see Al-Azhar Park and the Fatimid city and the walls and the work uh, that the Trust for Culture had done there. So uh, it was quite informative. And all the while, I'm trying to understand the scale, the scale of the detail, the scale of a Chahar Bagh and the different range of that. Because I think that's what's uh, missing in many interpretations of Islamic landscapes is a lack of understanding of material and scale. It's a, you know, something someone's seen in photographs is very different. His Highness said, you need to stand in these landscapes and feel the heat in India. You need to smell the fragrance of jasmine. You have to, in a way, uh, measure these landscapes with your own body. And I appreciate that very much. As a landscape architect, we have to experience the world with all of our senses. And the Islamic garden elevates you by touching all of those senses of sound, sight, smell, and taste. So it was uh, on that trip that I was just digging, 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 trying to understand what was this garden going to, to be about? How was it not going to be a copy of or quotations of existing gardens? The worst would be if it were a pastiche of famous gardens. But it needs to, to answer this brief of the 21st century. And I thought about, um, you know, what are the different... Uh, challenges of our century. And, you know, right now there are many, um, but one of them is uh, agriculture and the health and sanctity and safety of food and the quality of water. Those two things are intimately connected. And it was standing at Ram Bagh, a spectacular garden that when I was there was uh, almost in ruin. All the flowers were gone, all the plantings were gone. Um, it's a garden that had not been transformed by the English, by a Chahar Bagh being filled with soil and bringing the plants up to level, but it still had elevated walkways because the four tanks of a Chahar Bagh were often lower. Shrubs and plants planted there sheared across the top and they would flower on the top like carpets. But you could divert water into them and they would build a kind of microclimate in the heat and you could preserve the water, um, use a little bit to... Uh, cultivate the plants. Um, so being at Rambag with none of the flowers or plants there, but only the architecture of the garden, I realized that the inherent language of geometry in the Islamic garden is born from agriculture in arid climates. So the cistern, the tank, the font, the source, then carefully managed water in a small, narrow stone channel 
to convey it to the plants that need irrigation in order to create food so that people could survive in dry climates. And that link to agriculture and to the productive landscape as the very roots of the form of an Islamic garden was mind-blowing to me and very fascinating. And it took seeing one stripped down to its very bones in order to build back ideas about agriculture. Now, this was very exciting because working with the University of Alberta, the department that manages the University of Alberta Botanic Garden is the Department of Life Sciences and the Environment. So they are keenly interested in agriculture and productive landscapes. So the idea of, of, of could this garden address through the idea of cultivation, uh, something within Canada that was an issue. And we discovered that there are very few sources of native wetland plants available in Canada for the restoration of post-extraction landscapes. So we thought, aha, we can take an Islamic garden, make it a productive garden, not just a pleasure garden or ornamental garden, as they've been interpreted um, so many times, but rather a beautiful uh, geometry, uh, uh, a garden. We could make a beautiful garden structured by geometry uh, with this thread of water used carefully to irrigate the plants they could be cultivated and the seeds given out. And in a way, it became a parallel of the positive radiating influence of Islam as the seeds cultivated at the Aga Khan Garden go out across Canada to restore these fragile ecosystems and ecologies. So for us, that became really the story of this garden and its power. Um, it's it's uh, only possible because of the partnership with the University of Alberta uh, they care for and host the garden and cultivate these um, wetland plants. So when you have a garden about the calibration of water and you're cultivating wetland plants, it's uh, a happy uh, marriage of mission and beauty. You you you're very uh, poetic about the the receiving of sensory experience in the way you describe it all. So with the added poignancy currently about health and uh, the pandemic is there some things that um, you know that poignancy is making us all want to go to greenness and gardens for for restoring the inner garden of the human being but also for rest general restoration so do you think that there are there are some lessons that you might want to um, expand on in relation to that, that current problem that we're having with health? Did you put any particular species or smells apart from the noise from the water and so on? Well, you know, the, the garden was designed maybe six years ago and then under construction and has been open to the public now for a couple of years. So um, I think the answer to that question is, you know, not knowing a pandemic was in our future um, it's more that lessons learned in that garden have conveyed to influence the way we're treating current landscape projects. And I think um, if you want a garden to truly heal, then it needs to, as I mentioned earlier, touch all of the senses. And so I think we, after the Aha Khan Garden project, our whole firm... Uh, is uh, probably more constantly aware of fragrance, color, sound, quiet. Um, just working with uh, His Highness on things like seating and you know seating in uh, uh, benches that allow you to have community and talk. And so those are outdoors, they're at a safe distance from one another, but you still can see each other. And so, the things that we discussed in this garden have almost uh, um, been, or they have been, they have been influential on how we address landscapes now to make sure that we are bringing forward the power of a garden to be healing, meditative, um, and uh, in a way, a, a sacred experience. Interesting. So, so let's go on to the site problems. I know it's on a dune ecology, and you refer to the platform uh, and the plinth. Were there some lessons from the 
issues you uncovered on site? Was there something specific that you might want to share with the audience? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when you imagine a large scale geometric form finding its way into an existing garden, um, it's quite a challenge. And His Highness had made a site visit with the president of the University of Alberta and the provost and the director of the garden and had made some observations in looking at different sites, different potential sites uh, throughout the existing botanic garden. And they uh, wandered through a dell that was a series of bowl-shaped uh, terrain. And this is part of this perched high dune ecology that is typical in Alberta. So the trees grow very slowly. Um, the, the soils are very shallow and they're deep sands uh, beneath what topsoil you have. So His Highness uh, recognized this the shape of this uh, wetland bowl, and it did have perched water and wetlands in, in the floor of this area. And then there was a moment where there was a high ridge, and he suggested that that would be the point for prospect over the garden, and it looked down over an existing pond. So in a way, he envisioned the um, procession through the garden that we picked up and, and brought form to. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm the one speaking to you today, but as you know, we have a large team at Nelson Bird Waltz on this project and uh, working very closely with me on the design lead uh, was Breck Gastinger and Nathan Foley was also particularly uh, instrumental in the construction supervision of the whole project. So. You know, as a team, we take these instructions from His Highness and we start fitting them to the site. So the result is a very quiet and intimate arrival into the wetland. So the sign to the Aga Khan Garden is a very modest wall with the symbol of, of, of His Highness and just says Aga Khan Garden. And you walk through this wall and you're on a narrow boardwalk that takes you across the wetland. So you're very aware, you're immersed in an authentic Canadian experience, and you come to a rotated rectangular garden that we call the Woodland Bog, or the Woodland Garden, and there is a large elliptical stone uh, table that has a shallow surface on the top that holds water, so it reflects the sky. And all through this walk, as you're approaching the garden, your our hope is your heart rate is going down you see the native plants of Canada, the boardwalk we were able to insert with doing very little uh, tree removal for the garden. At the end of the boardwalk, there's a tiny trickle of water, the source fountain. It's very modest, it's very humble, it reminds you of a spring. So if your first water was the wetland, the ecological water, the second is reminding you of a spring, the source of life. As you turn from that, you get to the chalk, which is an open plaza, and there are pencil jets of water that light makes a geometric tracery when it hits these uh, pencil lines of water. That beckons you to rise up the ramps or steps onto the Talar Terrace, which overlooks the Chahar Bagh. So the Talar are two open air uh, pavilion-like structures with a taut tensile roof to shelter people from sun and rain and snow. And it provides shaded prospect out over the garden. So this is a place to linger and take in the whole garden. It's also the mediation between the woodland walk and the formal garden. At the center of this terrace is the source fountain where the water surges up out of a geometric cube that again evokes this idea of the continuity of of uh, the presence of unity within the garden because the geometries are everywhere in the pavement, in the fountains. And then the water cascades down over a uh, chinikana, which was uh, something we were inspired by the chinikana of Mughal gardens, which is a wall of niches. I think the direct translation is China cabinet. Um, so in a garden, these niches would be filled with uh, oil lamps and water falls in front of it. So it, you can imagine in the 1300s, uh, that would have been like fireworks. I mean, it would have been a dazzling a display of water shimmering in front of this wall of, of lamps and candles. Then the water proceeds on a very large tank 
and goes to the Mutabi or the floating island. And that then cascades into the Kala Pond. So this is the sequence of water and experience through the garden from the wetland all the way to the pond. I want to add something I was mentioning earlier. So the Chahar Bagh, the Talar, the uh, Chabutra gardens, these small gardens of geometry based on the five petal rose and the six sided ice crystal. All of this is the formality one might expect in an Islamic garden. I want to make that distinction because thanks to the research of, of Didi Ruggles, we were made uh, clearly aware of the Islamic landscape beyond the garden. And that is the idea of the bustan. So many of the historic walled gardens would have had a bustan or orchard or grassland. It was the landscape of cultivation. So back to our ideas about agriculture being one of the crises that we need to, to solve today, this idea of the ancient Islamic cultivated landscape adjacent to water of fruit and grasses and um, grains inspired us to make a long meadow all the way around the Kala Pond. And I think there are 30 different varieties of fruit, uh, fruit trees that are grown. And here again, the partnership with the University of Alberta was phenomenal because they had done test trials on what fruit would be productive in that climate. So um, uh, that brings an Islamic landscape to the Islamic garden and the Islamic garden to the Canadian wetland and forest ecology. Wow. So, so you, I think you've described with wonder the, the tapestry of the supreme features that, that probably will lead people not only to stay there for a long time, but walk through as well. And that physical uh, picture that you're painting is already enticing, but maybe we should talk a little bit about the impact now, which is the, the people who haven't seen it, you know, what has happened beyond uh, the garden, beyond the university, beyond Alberta, has it had a a significant impact that, that you're aware of so far and and connected to that I suppose is you know how does it serve the the bigger questions that particularly Canada and the Canadian uh, Ismaili community relate to very well which is the platform for dialogue and concepts of pluralism so I'm just wondering whether it's already leading to some of those kind of conversations for Canadians yeah well I feel that the entire garden is rooted in this idea of pluralism. And um, His Highness was very clear about this being a landscape uh, that would welcome all people. Uh, anyone in the world should uh, be able to come here and learn something about the ancient culture um, of the, the Muslim world as it relates to landscape and gardens. And so as a place for people to come to gain enlightenment about the extraordinary cultural and artistic and horticultural contributions of Islam to the world, um, it is a powerful step forward in understanding one another as human beings, understanding one another's hearts. And my hope is that this garden uh, will touch people, will educate people, and inform them about the, um, the, the, the power of this very ancient, magnificent history of the Islamic landscape. So as a site for conversation, as a site for education, as a place for learning about things that uh, many people in North America are unaware of and not well-educated in, my hope is that this is an important step forward for us to come to know each other accurately and know each other's hearts. And in that way, we come to love each other. And I think the landscape, because it touches us in ways that we often can't really describe, I think the landscape is a perfect place for the dialogue of acceptance and pluralism to begin. Fabulous, Thomas, really wonderful. I think maybe we should go back and try and round it off to your kind of final comments that you might have. Um, I, I certainly am aware that you're working with the, the community and the FATC on a number of other projects, including 
you have worked on King's Cross, Burnaby, Houston, now Houston together we're working on. I wonder if you could uh, say something about what it's like to work with His Highness, the community and generally the Our Trust for Culture um, in your closing remarks, Thomas. And if you have any questions for me as well. Well, thank you for that question. It has been a tremendous honor to work with His Highness and in service to the greater Ismaili community in so many different places. Um, I have been um, so moved by his ability to uh, see right through complex uh, concepts and know exactly uh, the few words of direction to get us on track to achieve his vision for these different landscapes. And that has been uh, a, a great educational experience for me. Um, one of the things that is unique to His Highness is so often when we work for clients, we explain to them that we have a long and complex research process, that we have to deeply understand a culture that is not our own. And in this case, it was part of the brief was to do extensive research and to learn all we could about the Islamic diaspora. So we looked at um, Southern Spain, uh, North Africa, East Africa, um, the, the, the Far East, um, India, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq. So we're looking across the Muslim world at landscapes and trying to understand the fine nuances between each of these different cultural traditions across the Islamic diaspora. And so for me, it was a phenomenal scholarly journey as a maker, as a designer. As I said earlier, I am not a scholar. I've learned a lot, but I wouldn't put myself forward as a scholar, but rather a learner who builds things. And that's what's been exciting about King's Cross, uh, looking at the Maghreb and Southern Spain and the influence of the Alhambra and the Muslim influence in Spanish culture, and then be taking inspiration from that and making a very abstract garden uh, at the King's Cross project on the roof. Um, then now working in Houston and taking inspiration from the Persian or Iranian uh, diaspora and the tradition of those uh, Islamic gardens and bringing that into a 21st century interpretation. And then of course the Aga Khan garden in Edmonton was really influenced by uh, the Mughal history of Muslim landscapes. So it's been a tremendous honor to be trained and educated, uh, mentored by His Highness, and then given the opportunity to take that knowledge and apply it in different places and different cultures that respond to this idea of pluralistic education of the magnificent traditions of the Islamic landscape worldwide. Thank you, Thomas and Hanif, for that fascinating exploration of how architecture helps shape our vision for society. It's no wonder that the site upon which we stand today was almost 10 years in development and that such extraordinary care, attention and discipline was exercised in its planning and construction. One of my favorite quotes of His Highness the Aga Khan is that the garden is a very special place where the human meets further proof of the divine. As I listen to our guests and I look about me today, I can feel that sense reverberate throughout this magnificent setting. It fills me with a sense of awe and pride, as I know it has many before me and will continue to do so for hundreds of thousands of others in the decades to come. To our most distinguished guests, Mayor Don Iveson, President Bill Flanagan, Mr. Thomas Waltz, and Professor Hanif Kara, I offer our deepest gratitude for joining us today and for your exceptional commitment to serving the public good through your own areas of respective ex expertise and passion. And thank you to all of you for being with us. I hope this episode has helped to illuminate your journey and understanding of the critical role that architecture and the built environment play in shaping our lives. Good evening.